Dobry wieczór. Good evening. Dobry wieczór, szanowni państwo. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Angelika Muchowska, ja proszę państwa, Angelika nazywam Muchowska. się, chcesz powiedzieć? And my name is... Dziękuję bardzo. <laughs> Dobry wieczór. Tak, dziękujemy za brawa. One się przydadzą, proszę Państwa, bo ta dobra energia, która będzie płynąć w obie strony jest absolutnie niezbędna. Nie tylko dobra energia, ale też mam wrażenie, że mnóstwo fantastycznej i przydatnej w biznesie wiedzy. Największych imprez organizowanych od kilku lat tutaj na Pomorzu Zachodnim. To prawda, dziś solidna porcja wiedzy, o czym wspomniałem, ale też motywacji do działania i też takich impulsów, które dobrze poukładane i dobrze przepuszczone przez ciało i umysł spowodują, że wszyscy z tego spotkania wieczorową, późniejszą porą wyjdziemy o wiele bogatsi. Taką mamy nadzieję, taka jest idea dzisiejszego wieczoru. bardzo szerokiej tematyce designu. Będzie design, będzie moda, będzie kreowanie przestrzeni i przede wszystkim będą fantastyczni inne goście, bo dziś dla Państwa z różnych stron, nie tylko Polski, ale i świata zjechało się mnóstwo osób, które mają fantastyczne doświadczenia zawodowe. Wiem, że tu wśród Państwa na sali jest mnóstwo młodych osób, które różnych materii biznesowych dotykacie, od projektowania i tworzenia kapeluszy po budowlaną historię, więc rozpiętość znakomita, życiorysy bohaterów, których tu za chwilę zobaczymy, ich wiedza i umiejętność dzielenia się nią, to z całą pewnością będzie coś, co się Państwu przyda. Dodatkowo jeszcze jedna rzecz, bo nie tylko Państwo macie okazję to oglądać i doświadczać. Jest to też realizacja, która dostępna będzie w internecie, więc wszystkich Państwa, którzy oglądacie nas w wersji online, nie pochłaniamy się nisko mówiąc tak, że dobry wieczór. Jest czas na Wasze brawa, żebyś się po drugiej stronie wiedzieli, że jest czas, żeby Ci dać im głosy. So that the people who are watching us online know that they are important to us too. West Pomerania takes care of entrepreneurs. This conference is one of the three planned within this project. That's why I'm happy that you have come here so abundantly. Yes, because this is all for you. This element of knowledge sharing, this element of expertise and experience sharing is something that all of us will benefit from, regardless of your business, regardless of your profession, because anything we will hear here is an impulse for us to take the step, the first step in the right direction, to take the leap of faith. So let us start this evening in the right way. It's not just a coincidence that we are here in West Pomerania and in this place. Why? Because the hosts here know exactly how to create impulses. So thank you, thank you then for the host. I would like to invite the governor of West Pomerania, Olger Gablewicz, to join us on the stage. Good evening. Hello to every one of you. I am here with a certain dose of stage fright. I've been here in this place, on this stage, quite a number of times before, but never in this particular setting. So, in advance, I would like to apologize for any mistakes I make. However, I'm not the main star here, so I'm sure you will forgive me. Thank you for coming here so abundantly to this amazing meeting as I see it. Today, in this room, we are going to meet persons who are either taking first steps or are greatly experienced in business already. And on the other hand, we will meet persons involved in culture, art, design. This evening is exceptional, but also not coincidental, because to me, as the host of the region and the governor of the region and the whole West Pomerania Voivodship, this is just another step on our way, continuous way to changing the region, to changing how the region is perceived. This would be impossible without you. The office that I represent is just a tool to change our reality. But the real creators, the real persons who change the West Pomeranian reality is you, both you in the room 
also those who are not present here, including those who are present online. I hope they are abundantly watching us too, thanks to the novelties of technology. I have only been the governor of the Voivodship for 12 years, modestly saying. I think that I'm turning 12 in this office next week, but I remember it perfectly well when, as a young person, young politician, I was taking the first steps in this local government world. So, the perception of West Pomerania was like this. Well, yeah, it's a pretty region, beautiful beaches, but as for its economy, well, not very well. The highest unemployment rate in the country, the huge state-owned farms, and a lack of modern economic challenges. Maybe you can not feel this when you are here in this room, but I travel a lot across Europe nowadays and the perception of West Pomerania region has changed for a number of reasons considerably. Maybe you don't know that very well, but in Poland, in all of Poland, everybody in my domain in me knows that we are an absolute leader in renewable energy sources in Poland. And we are beginning to become one of the biggest leaders in renewable energy sources in the whole of European Union. Our region is one which is witnessing the huge development of e-commerce. So these sales technologies that are dominant in the world are present here as well. We have great ICT sector companies here. And I am also seeing creative industries developing very rapidly. Tonight we're going to talk about how to further develop creative industries. Because creative industries are the area where, thanks to certain entrepreneurial skills or senses and economic skills and a talent in design, in creation, in arts, we can break through any glass ceilings in the economy. Thanks to this, the regional economy or the regional the economy on the scale of the individual companies becomes one where the sky is the limit only. In this room and in the region, we have more and more entrepreneurs who want to approach the economic challenges in this particular way, meaning they want to find that, in fact, anything can be built here, thanks to our creative talents, thanks to our innovative talents as well. We want to stimulate that approach. Hence, we have this evening and further undertakings that we have planned for the future to which I invite you cordially. These are the actions, these are the steps which have made West Pomerania to change from a region which was associated with some lagging economy high unemployment rates, to become a region which this year received the European Entrepreneurship Award, received from the European Committee of the Regions. Among the leaders are regions such as Barcelona, so that's the top where we want to be. I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much. Always classy, always to the point, and always brief. Big applause. Thank you very much once again. The marshal can hear us. I have to say that you are very lucky because in, it's not in many Polish regions and cities there are so many inspiring things with good energy of motivation, especially with such a group of personalities like the one that you will that you will see tom uh, tonight. We told you that we will have people from different parts of Poland, but also from different parts of the world. Those of uh, them who are from Poland 
uh, do things that are noticeable around the world, and it is a great stimulus for, for activity. But what's more important, an interesting thing happened just before our conference. It was a mentoring program. It was a new thing and an opportunity to use inspiration, creativity, and perhaps some novelties, novel activities for one of the companies of from West Pomerania. Yes, indeed, it is a very unique opportunity, and we will tell you more details about that in a moment. But this is the foundation of what is the essence of our meeting, so that young people who are at the beginning of their professional and creative journey, because we would like to emphasize that we are in the world of design tonight. It's important to give those people an indication and a hint on what they can do in a better way, in a different way, what pieces of puzzle they can add uh, to their professional life to achieve success. The next speaker uh, will take the floor in a moment to specify and tell us in more detail about the mentoring program. Uh, let us invite the head of the Cabinet of the Marshal, Mr. Krzysztof Barczyk. Big applause. I oto on, proszę Państwa, powitajmy go brawami. Jeszcze chyba nigdy nie było tylu przedsiębiorców z branży. We have never seen so many creative industry entrepreneurs in one place. So I'm very happy to be here with you, although I have to admit that I cannot see you through the smoke. The creative industries uh, are full of people who have heads full of ideas, and they are creative enough to run their businesses in these difficult times. And we have another group of people in this room, people who have not yet made the first step, and we hope that events like this one will uh, encourage them to take this challenge and to start their businesses. West Pomerania always looks for new creative ideas because we want to be the best in the world. Indeed. And this is why we have this project that we want to develop together with business people, because your products and services are the best ambassadors of West Pomerania. And it wouldn't be possible without you, without your ideas, without your fantastic stories. That is why we developed uh, this project called Your Business Under the Flag of Success. So that is why we started to uh, have uh, great events and great companies and great movies about companies. Uh, let me mention Gosia Jembai with her magical uh, patterns, ma magical um, bed linen designs. Gosia is an inspiration for many of us. A person who confirmed that what we do makes sense was Titus Wajdecki, the first person in this slide. Titus is a 20-year-old boy who, apart from playing saxophone, he designs and makes men's suits with his own hands. A person who has turned down, uh, turned upside down the, well, my um, perspective of what is happening is Joanna Jurka, who is an ambassador of this conference she's sitting in the back of the room. Please give her a round of applause. Joanna Jurga is our analog astronaut. She's a girl with a PhD degree and she started to design outer space and space base in, the, in outer space and on planet Earth. And I need to tell you about yet another person who is a great inspiration for me, and only because she did not uh, get enrolled in medical studies, she became interested in physics, started her studies at the university, physics, astrophysics. Now she is 27 and she cooperates with NASA and the European Space Agency. After the speech from Martin Lindstrom, we thought that uh, we want to learn from the best. Martin Lindstrom was um, declared by the Times as one of the most influential people in the world. Martin deals with purchasing predictions. Not many people know what it is, but the pr his message is that we uh, 
need to take to learn the skills from the best in the world and give it to you business people this is what inspires us to do our mentoring sessions we are the first regional government to implement uh, such mentoring sessions in Poland we start with design today next one, one will be a program a mentoring program for marketing uh, and the next one innovation. What are these mentoring sessions all about? We have meetings directly with businesses, meetings of a person who has the knowledge and expertise uh, and can share that. It was the most difficult part of our program, of our project. We like to plan things in our marshal's office, but making it, it successful is a very difficult challenge. And we have a great team helping us to make that happen. We have a great contactor, contractor, but we also have a great mentor, Katarzyna Konieczka, a well-known artist working all around the world. And with her bold costumes, when I see them, uh, we may perceive her as a very sharp, difficult person, but in direct contact she's a very kind and nice and friendly person who's very willing to share their knowledge, her knowledge. And with the company winning the mentoring competition, this is the best knowledge. The girls were able to communicate and understand each other. A mentoring program is a meeting in the company, because otherwise it's not possible to take the information from the business person if we don't see how they work, what they work on, what kind of projects they work on, when you can see and touch the project and design, see what it looks like. So as, as you can see, the mentoring program was won by Wasted. These are crazy girls. It's a difficult word. They are designers of post-apocalyptic fashion. I managed to pronounce that difficult word. A moment ago, this mentoring program was a very unreal, unrealistic program, because how would the marshal's office manage to implement that? But several weeks ago, we had it all worked out, and we knew that we were able to do it. Today, you can judge us by the, by the results. And let me invite you today to take part in yet another competition for mentoring program. You can submit your applications for the mentoring program program in management and marketing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Again, very brief and down to the point. So you know almost everything about this project. We know that it's, it is about post-apocalyptic design, and it's worth um, getting to know all these people who are behind this project. Uh, let's start with the mentor, a woman, and a very explosive woman. Uh, if you haven't heard about her before, don't worry. Uh, even myself, a person, a journalist dealing with lifestyle for over 20 years, I lost that information. And this means that perhaps the screen, the mesh is, is too big. T today we will see a great, a true pearl in front of you. She designs, designs, cre design creations, costumes. Her creations are used for photo sessions. If you... Uh, Think about Lady Gaga, Madonna, Fergie, Amber Rose. Then you know that the area where our artist uh, works, the, our artist works in, we know that we are at the top of global show, show business. And if we um, see David LaChapelle or Nick Knight, photographers, we know that it's good. They. Uh, want to take photos of models uh, in her costumes and designs. As the only designer in Poland, she was um, mentioned and by CNN uh, in her list of 10 fashion designers of the future. She uh, is a graduate of the costume design school in uh, Warsaw. She cooperated with Vogue, Italia Vogue, uh, the Dutch Vogue, my favorite fashion design um, 
magazine, uh, this fashion magazine. She is um, uh, in 2012. She uh, was listed as one of the most wanted fashion designers. She received positive reviews for from greatest fashion critics uh, and reviewers uh, all around the world. From Livier and Le Court. Sounds good, right? Who wouldn't have liked to have such a dossier and such a CV? And this is what she has, and this is the right time to introduce her to you. Katarzyna Konieczka is with us tonight. She deserves your applause well very much. We wanted to be closer to you, but uh, it seems that the lights cannot work uh, like this and, and we cannot get closer to you. We can see that there is quite a lot of you. We know uh, that uh, you will uh, benefit from this evening. I wanted to make you familiar with this stage, with these lights and everything that we have prepared for you. The light is so strong that I cannot see everyone in this room, so I am not, I do not have stage fright. We can imagine this room full of people, and we can hear it with your applause. So once again, Kasia, now you can see that, you can hear that. We read about your achievements, how do you do it? How, how do you reach that kind of people? What kind of creative talent do you have to um, stimulate and use to become uh, such a great pe person in the fashion world? It is a lot of work, but also things like a belief in your own own uh, unmistaken intuition, uh, the belief in your inner child. Uh, there's always someone who wants to cut your wings, but you need to believe that you are right and not everyone around. It did not work when I was young. Now the world is changing. You need to be able to knock on various doors and to demonstrate that what you do is nice and good. Can you remember a breakthrough moment in your creative career when you started to think that I'm at the right, I've made the right step, I'm at the right level? There was a number of such moments, but in the beginning when I started the first photo shoots were the costume, because I design costumes for avant-garde photo shoots, not for uh, everyday use or um, evening receptions. No, it's for avant-garde photo sessions. And when I noticed that when people on the internet, totally total strangers started to write comments uh, who, uh, which said, well, I can see this is Konieczka. Did I know them? They started to recognize my style. And another such moment was when uh, I had first publications in Vogue. It was, uh, I did not have any serious publications. And then it turned out that the British Vogue noticed me from one of the photo shoots of fashion shows uh, from this part of Europe. So I was really crazy with happiness and then other artists starting to knock on the door of your atelier sending their agents to you sending emails asking you for something beautiful to happen well I wasn't quite ready for that it happened it all happened too fast so instead of creating something nice I thought well I am ready to to send something they always approached me and I was a bit well what do I do now so the first thing that you that's important yes this applause is, is well deserved so when you start to get familiar with this global fashion world 
when you start to acknowledge the fact that they are indeed writing to you. Well, it's it's best to put it aside, and it's best to think, well, she's my close friend. Otherwise, you would just run around screaming with joy. Well, my hands would be shaking if I'm if I was aware of that, especially if you were designing in the the corset for Małgosia Rosanek Maidan. You, you can see that the breasts have to be very spiky so that noticeable uh, so that they um, will be shown in all the media. We designed the Viking costumes and everyone liked them. And I was a bit disappointed because no one could c- complain about them. And it ca- in case of that costume, they did complain and they they wrote about that. Gosia did like that as well. She likes to send this kind of impulses. And it's great that she has found an artist who created this this. Uh, global media commotion. So what are you working on? Well, we are, I have some ideas, but it takes time. You can see, we can see pictures of some of your costumes. These are real works of art. How much time does it take? What kind of your brains do you have to use? And how many cuts do you need to have in on your hands to make these things uh, happen? Well, my hands have quite a lot of scars, but but when you start, when an artist starts working, you lose the sense of time and you lose the sense of pain. Reality is not important. You need to set your alarm clock uh, because otherwise you would spend more time, 10, t- 10 hours more than you have planned in your design studio. We know a bit about you already, thanks to this introduction. Production, but the sense of this meeting and its depth is about your knowledge as a result of many years of experience to be shared with other, others. And we are approaching this, we are talking about this role of a mentor. How did you feel as a mentor? I had to say, I already said that I felt great. I felt fantastic. When everyone is looking at me and listening to what I have to say, I love it. This is my favorite situation ever. As uh, as far as we can see with uh, this applause, uh, our attendees love you already. Well, I love the situation. No one uh, can challenge what I have to say. So let me tell you something. Tell us, uh, please tell us something about this mentoring process. We went beyond the the scope of our prearranged meetings. So apart from the analysis of this, let's say business. Well, I say let's say business because the girls who have won this competition are artists. There's a lot of detail. There's a lot of work. It's art. It's not just a business manufacturing something. So apart from this analysis, we also focused on freeing ourselves, uh, on thinking about what we want. This was a psych- these were psychology sessions because they are artists. They are creators and the psychological sphere is very important and I think the, we have this symbolic expansion of our horizons. Uh, I'm very bold uh, when I'm talking about that because we had a number of phone calls, a number of sessions, but I think that's, that's the way I feel about it and the girls, I think, they also feel that something great has happened. We hear that you became friends, that there's some kind of chemistry between yourselves. Uh, you all, you even said that you were rediscovered sisters, sisters rediscovered after a long time. Yes, that's the way I called it. We do things that are similar with our hands, a sort of manual labor. So uh, that's the way I called it. Uh, I said that it's great to uh, to rediscover your sisters after many years. What have you learned? Well, and what are the things that y- could be used for creative and art business? I think there was quite a lot of know-how. 
technically black and white, uh, how things are made, and there is also an expansion of creative horizon. So a reversal of the situation that as creators they should do um, or make functional things. And we just said, okay, let's forget those stupid pieces of advice. Let's do something crazy. And it was successful, this technical sphere, how to do and make things, and this psychological part, close to a heart. If you do something with your heart and with your creativity, and you have the right um, skills to do it, if you do it in a professional way, then it is a step in the right direction. In every business, we have additional parts, additional components, how to present it, how to distribute that, how to promote it, how to uh, increase the demand for your brand. On the one hand, it is easier because there's a lot of tools in social media, but on the other hand, it's difficult because there is a lot of such things. So there is a question about how to stand out. Did you ask yourselves this question or... Am I just... <laughs> well, did, we did think about this, but I will not reveal any details. Now, when I start talking about that, do you all have sleeping bags? <laughs> we have a bar that will be open in two hours from now. Maybe just a few pieces of advice. Don't be afraid to romance with pop culture. Don't be afraid of childish or childhood ideas. If you have an idea, a business idea that stems from your childhood dream, remember your inner child. Your inner child may, may have some crazy ideas, but be, keep your foot in the sandbox, at least one foot in the sandbox. Of course, we need to be mature to um, function in this world, but if it was your childhood dream that made you operate in this business, and then you need to keep your foot in the sandbox. And don't be, for, don't be afraid that playing on, with social media is something childish. It is a romance with social media. Don't be afraid of that. And another piece of advice, you, you sent an email and no one responded, and 10 entities or institutions that are uh, in the path of your career did not respond. Well, it's you need to send at least six emails to each and every one of them. Well, they have 100 or 200 emails per day. Sometimes I did not respond to emails and I received messages on Instagram or Facebook. So it is important to be convinced that I'm doing something fantastic and that I need a very specific person to do that. If they don't respond, they did not really get that. They didn't comprehend that or they did not notice that. So if you don't enter through the door, you need to knock on the window. It's not a contest or competition. I'm, I cannot lose a competition. I don't like losing competitions. I'm, I'm, it makes me sick. But sending an email that, is, that no one responds to is not a competition that you have lost. So you need to put it all in the framework, framework of your psychological safety and don't give up. It is not a contest or a competition, but there was a competition before this conference. And the company took part in the first edition of the mentoring program uh, with you, Kasia, and I think it's the right time to invite them here. Girls from Wasted Couture, Viola Varich, Małgosia Varich, and Małgorzata Kowczyk. Here they are.
A lot of things show to us that half of the audience are your friends. We absolutely know no one in the audience. I think you have a fan club here in the audience. Approach the light, please, so that we can all see your smiles. We have made sure that you're in full light here, but I think you have made sure of that too by taking your passion, your cooperation into your hands. How long have you cooperated with each other? We've been running the company for six years now. Every year we are gaining more and more assistance. Our company keeps growing. We are not stopping. And now, thanks to the mentor program with Kasia, I think things are going to get even better. You have taken care of your backyard. It is now full of bloom. So now it's time for touching up on new matter. Is that why you applied for the competition? I have heard that you've been on holiday, or you were on holiday when you applied. Well, we had known about the mentor competition before, and we knew that the award through that competition was partnership with Katarzyna, and there was no option we would not have applied. But it happened that we were in the United States at that time. We had to find Wi-Fi connection. We did find it. We did apply, fortunately. Oh, yes, you did. And you have made a great impression. What do you think was your strength that allowed you to enter the competition and to win it. I think our power, our strength is that every time we do our best, and we did our best also while writing our application, especially that Katarzyna was an idol of ours and we really wanted to win this competition. As it seems now, or as it appears, it is worth fighting for your dreams. What has the time together with her given? Given you. I think the time and the telephones together gave us an opportunity to have new discoveries, to make new revelations. Now we are at a stage where a lot of things need to be rearranged. Thanks to Katarzyna, we have adopted a very new approach to how to look to the external world. We used to have a vision. When Katarzyna came and she took a look from a different perspective, she was able to point to things we had not seen before. Katarzyna is right in many things, and we absolutely know for sure that all the pieces of advice she gave to us will, on the one hand, require months of work, but on the other hand, will certainly help our brand to flourish around the world. So it is not only going to be you who know about us, but hopefully the outside world will too. Today's world has no limits. Dreams can be shaped and inflated so they fly up to the ceiling, but you have to carry out certain work. Work on yourself, work on what you do, and you need to understand in yourselves. Definitely. Believing in yourself is the most important thing and one of the most important lessons we received from Katarzyna. She, at the very beginning, said, goes, you have to believe in yourselves. Indeed, we might have lacked this faith in ourselves. Now we know that it can only get better. Please, tell those who don't know how you share your skills about what you do one by one. What do you have on offer? Something that you can share with us to enrich us with knowledge. Well, I'm the boss, right? Well, perhaps, maybe, but together with this girl, Jagoda, who's very stressed out and it probably shows. Do you want some applause from the audience?
Jagoda, nie you ask, you get. Jagoda, no reason to be stressed out. You're on your own family ground. So please do not worry. We're here with you. How do you share the tasks? Well, as it comes to the conceptual work, we try to cooperate with each other. I'm mainly involved in trips that we go on. We've had a lot of trips this year. We have been to the United States, Belgium, the Czech Republic for various festivals. Yes, exactly. You have not been traveling for holidays. So what have you been going there for to generate such costs? Well, these have been festivals where we have showed our mobile boutique. We wanted to show to the people visiting the fairs what products we had on offer. Our departure for the United States was also a dream of ours. This was not Burning Man, right? No, it was a post-apocalyptic event. A post-apocalyptic festival where we had our stall too. And what turned out was that a lot of people recognized us there and they were wearing our clothes. So we were quite shocked while walking around the festival. We saw some people wearing our clothes. We approached them and told them, you are wearing our clothes. We come from far away, from Poland. And they were surprised too that we came such a long way to the United States. I'm not worried that you have such a range of impact, because that's absolutely something that we can't just dream about to create something on this continent and see your things on another continent. I understand you carry out your sales through the internet too. How is your work organized? Well, we mainly sell through the United of via the internet to our customers from abroad and we also do our sales through our trips to Europe and other places, festivals. We try to look for new spaces, areas that are varied so that we can proof test our clothes against various backgrounds to see how motorcycle fans or fantasy fans are going to find our clothes. We try to cooperate meet with people. That's why we believe it's worthwhile going on trips. You can also meet people, other designers in such on such trips that will broaden your horizons. Thank you. We could spend hours always talking to you, but we have quite a tight agenda, so I need to look at my wristwatch. And yeah, we have now to see your common child. Yes, we've been talking about the past. We talked about how you emerged and what you did. Now let us talk about the future, about the plans and your common project. You were supposed to meet for just a while, but it turned out that it's this kind of chemistry between you led to a specific concrete inspiration between each of you. Yes, we wanted just to have a, a series of three meetings in Szczecin, but we kept calling each other by phone. We teleworked with each other, with Kasia. We kept sending films and pictures to inspire each other. And we have inspired ourselves so much that we have come up with something that we are about to show to you. Kasia, during the mentorship program, proposed that we should sh produce a joint collection. Let's hear this applause. Do not intervene the Applaud us, please. Yes, we will have an opportunity now to show to you a sample of what we've done together. This is a deed that is a prototype of our first collection. What is extremely nice is that you said that you threw an artistic beam of light that was supposed to activate the ghost to start thinking. Could we get a bit more light? Exactly. Perhaps our audience just got scared away because at the first glance, this outfit might be horrible. No way, I was thinking of taking it to, for the first communion party for my child. Okay, we can lend it to you. Well, the impression we have is a turbo impression. Can you see it from a close-up? 
Tak, tak więc tutaj inspiracją do stworzenia tego kostiumu. The inspiration for us when making this outfit was mainly anatomical models of humans. That's why we can see so many details of human anatomy here. But we were also inspired by Bekczyński's paintings. We are so in love with his art. We also wanted to establish some kind of romance with Katarzyna's art, so we made references to her art and we wanted to please her a bit. I hope we did this right. Katarzyna says, oh, I will make some improvements here too. In the backstage, uh, Katarzyna spoke or said a very nice thing about these wings. Could you elaborate on that? Well, I think this is the first, the largest structure that these girls made. I think it symbolizes not only whatever wings symbolize, meaning, um, I don't know, perhaps a high altitude flight with these wings spread, or hope for something great to happen, but also it symbolizes freedom, this wingspan. The form symbolizes, well, how to put this? They symbolize kind of purification, hope. This could be a metaphor to our mentorship program. Kasia gave us wings, and this is the evidence. Uh, yes, exactly. So, the only thing left for us to do is just to soar high in the sky, right? Yes, that's one thing. Another thing is to take a look from a good spot above and decide whether to land or not to land and fly on. That's the comfort that is beneficial in business. That's what we wish for you. Or we also wish for you this satisfaction. I hope that these wings, which are being premiered here in Szczecin, right now at this moment, will soon, thanks to our further cooperation on this project, will make sure that they will be seen not only here in Poland, but also outside of Poland. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for you, and Szczecin is too. Szczecin is showing this with its applause. Thank you very much for this meeting with us, for applying for the competition, for your great work, of which we can listen from you now. This is a dose of inspiration for all of us. What is great is also the fact that you have found yourselves so wonderfully here with your shared emotions, passions, cooperation. As we saw here, your cooperation is close and has been becoming more and more close within this project. Kasia Viola Jagoda Małgorzata. Perhaps a picture that you use as a souvenir in the future. The operator will get as much time as he needs to take a good photo. You can also approach the ladies on the stage and take a good photo. Thank you. Thank the, I'll thank the audience for the patience and hope. I'd like to thank you for what you've done. Wasted Couture and Katarzyna Konieczka. Now, another fantastic story. We are so grateful for it because this is a great signal showing that it's worth abandoning a local perspective. Of course, we all remember about our roots, but leaves should fly away 
far away with the winds to other continents. I think this kind of thinking gives you an opportunity to do things that are beautiful and noticeable all over the world. This is also a good example showing that being an entrepreneur in West Pomerania, you can still apply to, for competitions, take part in such nice projects which are no longer local but are national or international. It's worth remembering about a few things we've heard. First of all, you should take an insight into yourself and never let go. That's what we heard from Katarzyna and the girls, and we should be thankful for that. Now, what road did our next speaker have to take? Probably he will tell you about that. That's a great privilege to be able to hear him. It's also a great pleasure to watch his projects and designs. He's a process designer. He's an artist, an architect, the creator of the first inflatable profile in the world. He has received many design awards. His projects have been shown in our part of various museum resources like the Centre Pompidou, Momart and others. One of his greatest achievements is his original method for sheet metal forming using internal pressure with air. He has a passion for continuously discovering the potential of material and the skill of interdisciplinarity. His achievements are not only individual uh, pieces of furniture, but also huge structures that have been shown in various places. Now, let me say that Oskar Zienta, who is going to speak to us now, is a genius in what he does. Oskar Zienta, let's give him a huge hand of applause. Good evening. 23 years after I left Szczecin, after I defended my diploma thesis, I went to Zurich and Dad, there, after my first PhD and after my second PhD, which I made in two faculties, in the Faculty of Architecture, while I combined it with another PhD in another faculty, that was quite a novelty at that time, because I combined it with my studies in the faculty of uh, machine construction. That was when I realized, while work, writing a work about Jean Trudeau, who and whose family worked in metal, who answered a lot of times the question, why metal? He always answered it in the following way. What do you mean? This is our family tradition. That was when I realized that while working in metal, this was also my own family tradition. As it was mentioned a minute ago, we sometimes go back to our roots. So, we in our company are trying to go back to the roots. Perhaps, however, by recreating them anew. I never knew my grandfather. The only link between us was my father, who abandoned this activity. But 12 years ago, together with my dad, my sister, and my wife, we opened up a small business. And just like my grandfather, cast and formed metal in a direct way using his uh, hammer, we are trying to be blacksmiths 2.0 by casting and forging metal using digital ways. Specifically, the FIDU method, Freie Innenbruch Informung, or Free Internal Pressure 
the formation. I started this in my university. Then I transferred the machines, the robots, to Poland, where we opened up that business. We are trying to be blacksmiths 2.0, or maybe not even 2.0, because technology is developing so fast that we are now trying to be blacksmiths 4.0. Meaning, already in the design phase, we are simulating the deformation of the sheet. We are inflating the sheet metal in our computers. We know how it will behave. Then we produce these materials hands-free in reality. And at the end, we have scanning machines like the one in the photo here that allow us to compare the real form that left the production process with the computer simulations. This process allows us to get to know this technology better. Now, a short movie that will tell you. Normally, designers design the form of a given object and try to adapt the technology to it. In our case, we control the production processes while the form is the result of that production process. We refer to this as process design. When you see a product made using the FIDO technology for the first time, you get the impression it is soft. The moment you touch it, only then do you see that it's actually inflated, but it's made of some hard metal. The production process is very simple. We cut out sheet elements, sheet metal elements using a laser. We weld them tightly to make a contour and then we inflate them to make a stable 3D form. Working using FIDO technology is like carved sculpting clay. Metal forms naturally under air pressure and shows its natural deformation face. Today we are playing and learning in micro scale to get to know technological bases for further applications, such as lightweight architecture structures, automotive applications and space applications. By using structural ideas, we are able to create light lighter and more durable structures. I refer to this as less weight, more opportunities, or all you need is less. All you need is less was the slogan we used in promoting the new model of Audi, but also one that we used to promote our products as well. What is important for our business is certain important slogans that we come across on a daily basis. That's the bottom-up process where we think and we study materials of which we will make our products later on. To this, we adapt conformist technologies, and on this foundation, we build the form. We build real objects. Therefore, this process is one that is very important in our company. We also were able to make our dream come true where our design office is actually a laboratory, a research, experiment and production laboratory where we talk about such things as light, light weightedness or volumetric expansion or controlled lack of control. To this all, we add cooperation with 
Ten modern, modern craft jest dla nas um, craftsman. Bardzo ważny. Modern craft uh, is very important to us. Team, uh, But what is the most important is our team. This tak, is our Wrocław-based part of team. Trzy, osoby. 12 years ago we were starting as a group of three or four persons. Now our team is approximately 70 people. So what you can see here is the part of the team that operates in Wrocław. We are a fantastic group of people. Or they are a fantastic group of people who are helping me build, create, build a company, produce products, objects, sculptures, but also the helping me run research projects. I think that all of this is appreciated by the curators of various museums because we have been hosted by over 40 museums around the world. Our products are part of permanent exhibitions there, starting with Plopper, the Polish folk product that is inflated with air through other products like chip and steel or the more radical objects which by the way were designed by inspiration with the first deed of Polish constructivists Strzemiński by cutting out, cutting off and changing directions where again in a single object we combine our sheet metal structures with old-fashioned materials and methodologies for processing leather which is then sold to sheet metal. So, as I said, ultra light weightedness is what is the most important to us. Thanks to feed through technology of inflating metal with air, we create light and durable objects that go beyond trends. In 2019, inspired by Geo expressed in his project of the Superlegera chair. We created Ultra Legera, the world's lightest chair. Ultra Legera has been created. To krzesło zostało stworzone jako efekt pasji. It's the opportunity to create a structurally optimized product whose form is strongly rooted in the natural world. In our practice, we like observing nature. So before we started designing, we observed trees that adjust their cross sections to the existing loads. We admired the wings of dragonflies and the pneumatic bird skeletons, which are delicate but extremely strong. Then we transferred these solutions to the Ultra Legera's construction. A chair is used for sitting, but think how many times you move a chair from place to place. Although the Ultra Legera gives us an impression of a standard solution, when lifted, it surprises everyone with its lightness and stability. We managed to cut its weight to a little over 1,660 grams. That is why it is so functional and user-friendly. The Ultra Legera's lightness is the effect of combining innovative technology with lightweight material. Its durable frame, seat and backrest are all made of recycled, eco-friendly aluminum. First, we produce an aluminum sheet from recycled pieces of metal. Then, we cut the two-dimensional form and in the process of inflating, transform it into a three-dimensional object. The Ultra Legera is 100% made of one metal, so it is fully recyclable. It follows the philosophy of model material thinking and thus meets the premises of the circular economy. It is easy to disassemble and recycle it. Thanks to the uniform distribution of force arrows on its surface, the Ultra Legera is extremely durable. In a test, the immobilized chair endured a load of a stunning 1,200 kilograms. Together with this load-bearing properties comes resistance to the atmospheric conditions and the passage of time. You can use it both inside and outside, and is destined to be a life companion. A child can use it as a table. A teenager can sit on it by a desk. 
and an older person will enjoy its lightness. Then the chair will be passed on to another generation of users. The Otra Ledra manifests Yeta Studios' values. It is response to the challenge of the contemporary world. Climate change, resource depletion, and mass overproduction of cheap items. It represents the design of the future. Through lightweightedness or ultra lightness, we are proving that this is a way to create eco friendly and sustainable products for the generation. One chair for a generation. This year we have launched a whole collection of stools, tables, chairs, and the first test was 550 kilos at the beginning. And then we ran professional tests for 1,208 kilograms. What you can see here is 550 kilos. We also play with the form. We try to use a generative designing approach. The best example is not a project, but a program of G-Table, which we always create in cooperation with the final customer. These tables see no limits. The longest table we produced recently was five meters long. We adapt the width, the, the height, the materials. Everything is computed through special software that allows us for very precise production. Sometimes our products become dominates in spaces. Sometimes, however, we hide them. They are like chameleons on walls. Thanks to our new Metsni Shiny collection, we can squeeze materials, we play with them, we inflate them, we mold them, and all of this in tight cooperation with internal designers from all over the world who motivate us to work in spaces within their projects. That's why our projects get to wonderful spaces. We also play with pigments, with paint, to produce wonderful colors. That's not all, however. We try to be beyond the definition somehow. We not only define our product, our things as products or objects of art, because we constantly move in between. In our interventions in various museums, we combine such things together. Sometimes we show them, other times we try to hide them. We also play with surfaces. They can be veneered or painted or coated, powder coated. What we can see here is a sculpture from your space, the space of Szczecin. We had an opportunity to give an exhibition here, and we have left behind a sculpture, which is sort of three-dimensional recording of sound in the lobby of Szczecin Philharmonic building. I went there today, and it still looks awesome. We also run other projects. This is a challenge we obtained from the curator of Dwór Artusa in Gdańsk. When we entered that building, I knew immediately that this had to be something amazing, because when entering that building, there is the sculpture of Neptune there. And inside, the whole area inspires you. So we created a monster that came to dwell that Dwór Artusa. Of course, it is combined or related to all those 
Stories told in the 14th century by seafarers who spoke about such monsters living in seas. Now I would like to talk to you about a number of sculptures. One stands in the Wrocław Archipelago of Isles. The sculpture is called Nava or Nave, which references arch vaulted ceilings or the wooden sculptures of the Osiriski Library or the fair place of market place hall by Fruderman. We added more arches using the Fido technology. The entirety was made to commemorate the final events of the year of culture. We received a nomination from a competition. At the beginning, this building was controversial. Now it is beneficial for the city. More than 500 plus the political program. Because young people gather there, they date there, and whoever what happens later after they date. <laughs> yes, exactly. This is another project, the one before the last one, one that you can see in the Northern Gallery in Warsaw, a project of self-sustaining structures of 24 meters in height. They are self-bearing structures. They are so endurable, so endurable that they can bear their own load. And another project that we are now uh, performing or manufacturing for the city of Zielonogóra, we will have a park sculpture inspired by the Zielonogóra-based artist who used to be a director of the modern art museum. And the, his designs as reliefs, we made them into two two-and-a-half-dimensional objects, and then we played with them to achieve 3D sculptures. And I can reveal reveal uh, part of our research projects is the first rolled, blowed and rolled steel profile that we presented at the Victoria Albert Museum in 2011. And this is something that we are testing, and it will be a filament for the outer space department. So we used um, the pressure of air to form it. In outer space, there is no air. And we had to find another mixture, mixture that could be used to deform this profile. And that mixture was also uh, contained in the manifesto and something that you can bake in your oven. If you are interested, just scan the QR code. You can bake this heart on your own and you can give it to your love, loved ones as a baked 3D object. Thank you very much. Oscar Zienta, he even cleaned up after himself. It's a great story, fantastic story and fantastic uh, memories and great job that is in line with what is the essence of tonight's event. Because Oscar Zienta's uh, designs can be treated as innovative uh, and great creative ideas and we have the next hero or heroine. Uh, she started her work 25 years ago. She's an icon of Polish fashion at I was able to participate 
uh, and accompany her be an active part of the creation of this fashion giant. And I will tell you some personal stories during this meeting. She is a designer loved by Polish personalities, not only Polish personalities. Her collections were presented multiple times abroad. She was the first Polish fashion designer to have appeared in during the official calendar of the Paris Fashion Week. She does phenomenal things. She makes phenomenal, phenomenal things, works, true works, works of art. And our guest is... Gosia Baczyńska, proszę Państwa. Gosia Baczyńska, ladies and gentlemen. Come over here. We have the best spot here in the spotlight. You haven't, haven't seen it, but she bowed down towards you in the darkness. Now, once again. Good evening. It's great to have you here, my love. Uh, we know that our attendees are willing to hear about how to join the pieces of the puzzle in your lives, to do what you love and to do it successfully. You uh, started doing what you love at a late stage, I think. Is that what you think? Yes, I remember that it, it took you quite a lot of time, that this moment of breakthrough came a bit late. Well, wait. Back then, 25 years ago, indeed I thought, well, I'm, I'm old, I'm over 30, and starting my business at that point, now you can count how many years or calculate how, how old I am. But it did not take me a lot of time, it was just the circumstances. I worked as a costume designer for movies, for theater, for drama shows, then I studied, I went to London and where I learned, learned quite a lot. I um, went, I worked at a fashion studio uh, making short series for London's designers, including McQueen, but I kind of Missed him by, by thread. Well, but it was an important part of my life, uh, of my career. I learned the work culture and the quality that we did not have back then in Poland. It was the time of uh, marketplaces at stadiums and in the street. It was an important. Um, episode for me and several days ago I was visited by the owner of that fashion studio because we, we, we keep in touch and I visit she visited my atelier and she was shocked really well she said well Gosha it's good well I learned it somewhere well I feel the shivers because this is the essence of what we are talking about tonight it's worth to share the knowledge to to share it with other people, to teach other people, to teach them, to give them love for quality. Because if you were to select several words to describe what you're doing, I think one of them would be quality. Yes, indeed. Quality for me is absolutely fundamental. But also emotions, feelings, truth. Without the truth, without authenticity, without our souls, it wouldn't work. It could then be just a calculated, pre-calculated business. You make a business plan. I just need to make money. Then you can do it without the emotions, without, without your soul. But to do something in a very good way, to be a leader, to stand out, to give emotions to people, it must come from your heart. We will talk a bit deeper in a moment. We have some seats here. We'll organize a bottle of water and we'd we'll like to ask a nice person to bring the water. But we can have a round of applause. 
Ta cudowna młoda dama, proszę Państwa, this lovely young lady is taking care of uh, all the guests. If, we, if, we can ask, if I can ask you for some applause for her. Thank you very much for this care and attention. And we would like to thank the entire team from Event Factory taking care of all the aspects of this show. To all the people working at backstage for all the the sound and vision engineers. There's a lot of people backstage there. Uh, Gosia is here with us, and we would like to have a man next to her, a very talented person. Uh, whatever he touches turns gold. Whatever he touches is done at the highest possible level. Uh, it was the case with his dance school in Kielce. Then he moved to the capital city of Warsaw and made a career uh, uh, within three months by making beautiful haircuts, not only uh, for the opera, for the movies, uh, for photo shoots, and for each event he added a piece of himself working for other people. At, and he understood at some point that he is complete, that he can present his aesthetic clothing vision to the world. And he became a designer, and he made immediate success. Although he had to face some difficulties, we'll talk to him about that. Him? Let's see. Robert Kupis, proszę Państwa. Dobry wieczór Państwu. Jeden z mich znam. Kupis, ladies and gentlemen, he is here with us. You can stand next to us. You can see that he is the sense of rhythm. Well, I can dance if you, if I need to wake you up. No, you can see that the applause gives you a really good rhythm. They are well awake. Yes, you are used to, the, to applause. Yes, from my childhood. I was born and raised uh, in a rural area, but my parents worked at a culture center. And to enter uh, the cinema and the culture center, we had to, you had to pass through our home, through our house. So I danced, I sang, I drew, I drew and painted, but I understood uh, the much later how much Gatsky, that was the name of the place, how much Gatsky gave me. So let's talk about uh, Gatsky and pants as well, because you, you design pants. You know, you have known each other for quite a long time, and I think it is a good moment to tell you about what, um, what we three have in common. Gosia was having her first fashion show in Wrocław, and she invited Robert Kupisz as a hairstylist. It was first such assignment. Well, I can say, not one of the first. It was the first such project. Robert, it was your first fashion show. No, it's not. They, they lie a little bit. We met back there in Warsaw. No, but that was a small fashion show. I drowned my phone in a place where it shouldn't be. But it's not about uh, the phone that was drowned by a, a, a presenter. For me, it was the first time as a show host. It was a big audience at the Market Square in Wrocław. There was quite a lot of people, and it was your first public appearance, my first fashion show, our first cooperation. So it was our joint debut. Almost at the same time, we all arrived in Warsaw. And that was on the 25th of September, the year 2000. I feel the shivers on my back because I remember that very well. And uh, we started 
together. And I think we were successful. How do you think about yourselves, about, uh, about yourselves after those 25 years? Where are you in terms of creation and being complete? I like where I live. I think we are in the right place. And since my childhood, I wanted to fulfill my dreams. And I managed to to make all my dreams come true. And I wanted to tell you that if you have a dream, do not be afraid to fulfill it. Many people just dream and they are they are not fulfilled. You need to have the, the, the courage. Maybe I wasn't courageous too much. From uh, In hindsight, I think I, I made it um, all the way. I went all the way. I did not th- think about myself about, as a courageous person, but um, I managed to succeed uh, to fulfill all my visions, even I had a lot of, even though I had a lot of sleepless nights. If you're a child, you have your fears, but you also have to face the fears of your um, family and friends. I had a lot of it, and I arrived at the finish line with my last pieces of strength. So if you have a dream, do not let yourself be stopped. You can make mistakes, and those mistakes become very important in the future. Mistakes make us stand out among others. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't let anyone stop you. And please promise that to me. We will sign it in blood in just a moment. But I remember that you, because you say that you had you had fears, and well, you've already heard that we've known each other for many, many years. I remember a story about a boy from uh, Kielce who arrived in Warsaw. He went to a higher styling course, Bad Hat. You came back after several weeks of that course and you uh, conquered the um, Warsaw hairstyling market with icons who had been there for many years. And you were, you were a young boy with this new energy. What made everyone want to work with you? I had a dance school in Kielce, and after 10 years of running that dance school, we were quite successful. Um, we had Polish championships, we had international success. Dita Herbusz and Tomek Barański came from my school, so it was a very high-level team. But at some point I realized that, that I got burnt out and I decided to fulfill my other dreams and I went to uh, London to a hairstyling academy because I thought that I would like to be closer to fashion and in a hair salon I can survive this period because I, I could always make money by styling hair. This hair styling course took 15 days. I was at the age of 32 I learned a new profession. I also started at that age. So my sister, who believed in me more than myself, uh, enrolled me to an advanced course. It was, that was, uh, that was a mess, that was a circus. You had something in your hands. You attended an art secondary school. Yes, I remember your our first fashion show in the year 2000, a woman in space, when you made hats out of hair. He was able to do things no one else could. So a true artist. We'll let you finish that topic, but it is a clear indication that you took various things from your human being, from school, from from your family home. You combined all these pieces of puzzle to make a picture of yourself today. I started to be a fashion designer living off the things that I designed at the age of 44. 
It was quite late, but it was my childhood dream, but they did not know how to fulfill it. And this journey through uh, dancing and then uh, through hairstyling, I started to be a hairstylist for fashion shows and then in the opera in, pa in Paris. I had an agency in Paris. This made me, allowed me to get closer to what I want to do, to, to what I do today. I, I always knew I wanted to be a designer, but I didn't know how to arrange it. No one had ever told me. And those were the times when I tried to take part in various contests, competitions, and it, but it did not work. And at the age of 44, I came to a conclusion that this was the right moment. I had a certain recognizable name. I made a name for myself. And all these previous experiences were very good because they made me stand out from my from among my colleagues uh, of, of other fashion designers because my journey was quite different. I would like to move to, to the topic of Gosha and I would like to uh, run our discussion in such a way that you can get as much as possible for yourselves. So thank you very much about those remarks about um, car Courage and doing whatever you want. So you made a name for yourself as a hairstylist, because apart from what you were doing, people liked to work with you. So this interpersonal aspect was very important, because you always inspired models and personalities, celebrities, that things can be done in a different way. So you always had this aesthetic imagination. And the one, one last thing that I wanted to say, I remember jeans from a certain company that you you remade, you added some different thread, and I had the same jeans. My jeans did not look uh, well, did not they did not wear well. I don't know where you, where you were looking. So we focused on Robert, but let's come back to the moment when you start to believe in yourself when you take the step in the unknown direction. So this fashion, first fashion show was on safe ground in Wars in Wrocław. But if you want to do something in fashion in Poland, you need to be in Warsaw. What was your journey to Warsaw? You said it was on safe ground. Well, maybe. But I remember... I had this thought that I had to make this fashion show, that I had to have my proprietary fashion show. Indeed, we met we had met earlier at some kind of combined fashion shows, but, but I, it was an imperative for me that I had to do that, simply had to do it. So if you want something, you can do it. My friends uh, allowed me to use uh, the um, Parrot Club as backstage. Something was provided by the city of Wrocław, and it was the first step. Well, the first step was organized my studio, but I also had to fight myself for two years. I knew that I had to move to Warsaw, but I thought, well, no, why would, why does everything have to be in Warsaw? You probably understand that. Now the times are different. You can be here. You, we have, we have instant communications with the entire world. You can send pictures, movies, you can work online. Back then it was not possible. Two or three times per week I had to travel to Warsaw. After sleepless nights, I wasn't very responsible back then. But when I had an appointment in Warsaw, if I had to bring a skirt or a dress to a, to a store or to my client, you had to do it. And then you had to jump on the car after a sleepless night at work and then travel to Warsaw. Do, do you remember the moment when you felt, yes, I'm at the right place, the moment of fulfillment, a moment of becoming recognizable 
uh, when Gosia Baczyńska became a household name and you became a, a self-confident designer. Well, I remember that you made the uh, hairstyles, haircuts for that. Perhaps the first fashion show in Warsaw. The first fashion show... How do you call it? First proprietary fashion show that did not accompany first independent fashion show that that's the word I wanted to use <laughs> so we'll we'll play some word puzzles in a moment it was a great fashion show it was an absolute breakthrough you there was a passage between the two rooms some great artwork it was an abandoned building that had to be cleaned up it's uh, at the corner of uh, Złotań Jasna Street a hotel will be there soon. It's not opened yet. It was the first fashion show. Uh, the next day was like a tsunami had passed through Warsaw because everyone commented on that, but that's what it's all about. And then we had two other fashion shows, and then there were some awards. Gosia is a very humble person, and my memory is not working well. We used to work together, and all Gosia's fashion shows were absolute, total events. Apart from great fashion collections, she's a great host, uh, event host. Uh, also, uh, company birthdays, those were always parties till early morning. It is not just about fashion and clothing. If you have the need to express yourself, then the fashion show itself is some kind of an art performance. Uh, birthdays or theme parties. It was always about some creation from myself and from my guests. It was always some kind of entirety. I'm looking at the, at the clock and I don't like it. Uh, please restart the timer because we want to talk a bit for a bit longer. Unless you're bored. No. So we will use up some more minutes from from the schedule that we have to touch upon some important moments for you, inspiring moments for you. Robert, perhaps your transformation into a butterfly, it will sound well. So this moment of transition from one profession to another, or from one professional status to another, and your first fashion show. Yes, I made my first fashion collection at the age of 44, and it took me quite long. It was about a year, and I was so stressed out that I was afraid to show it to anyone. I came to Olivier's home, and her, his pregnant wife was the first one to, to try these dresses on. And I was always afraid of being judged. Robert came to our home to present his collection. Indeed, Carolina was pregnant with our first son. She had a beautiful uh, pregnancy belly. Uh, she was a top model earlier. And Robert brought two plastic garbage rubbish bags and he just uh, emptied them on the floor by saying, this is my collection, this is my fashion collection. I do not like ironing, so I immediately started designing clothes that uh, do not have to be ironed. Yeah, we know that it is uh, your trademark. She, uh, Karolina tried them on and it turned out that it was an absolute masterpiece. And it's a great honor to be with you at such moments that if you fill this piece of clothing with yourself, you 
add personality to to this to these clothes, and we can verify that uh, with the gentleman um, a calendar. We had uh, large men and tiny women, and whoever tried or put these clothes on, they, they gave personality to your clothing as a chameleon. So it was my idea for clothing to adjust to various body types uh, so you don't, do not have to lose weight to for them to fit. But I remember the first fashion show, I made this collection and I had no idea of what to do, what I should do to present it to people, how to organize Organize it. Do you remember when you when you called me and you asked me about how to organize a fashion show? So together with Olivia and yourself, it was very difficult for me. And it's the best way. The best way is to talk to many people because everyone will give us some kind of identification. And then you pro process that. You listened to others, but you did it your own way. The fashion was completely different. The fashion show was completely different because it started. You need to. You need to have a fresh perspective of the situation. We had some shoes, uh, very high heels that were impossible to wear. All the models were unable to wear these uh, these stiletto heels. And we thought, well, we need to do something about it. Because otherwise they will simply lose these uh, these shoes, and we, th we came to a conclusion that perhaps if they lose one, they they should walk without shoes. They should walk barefoot. Maybe it's a good idea to be spontaneous, um, greet people from the audience, and I told everyone to present their own personalities because these clothes need personalities, and then models, both male and female, start. To, to to get really spontaneous, everyone was different, and they involved the audience. The fashion show was received in a great, very positive manner, and there was a lot of stress related to that. And the first fashion show uh, made me very stressed out. I had problems with my balance. I um, I faded. I fainted. Sorry. And I went to the we went backstage and I cried in Gosha's arms. She came to congratulate me. Uh, I cried for five minutes. Let's say it was 50 minutes. It would sound better. Maybe half an hour. That cost me a lot of nerves, but for many years I never accepted it that I did something good, that I made some success. I had the impression that I had to keep going on doing next things and the next things. So my piece of advice for you is accept both successes and compliments and keep them in your heart because often we do not carry it away from our childhood. There are some gaps in our childhoods. So I had to learn to accept and keep these successes and compliments to build myself, to start believing in myself more so that what I do should be valuable to myself. That's very important. Can I add something? Yes, today at the backstage we spoke, we reminisced and you said this, Robert. I regret having been so tense in the past that I did not celebrate that success. And I had the same thing. Yes, that might be our published mentality, that it's not appropriate to indulge in your own success. Then a moment came, some seven or eight years after my debut, or maybe even ten years, that I said to myself, I do have a talent. And ever since, I have been able to say that. However, this did not begin. This, this does not happen at the very beginning. Yeah, there are some of us who have this, or have had this all their lives. I'm not talking about talent, I'm talking about 
the other thing you were talking about. Yes, the moment when you can get to a point where you can appreciate what you have done, appreciate the way you have covered. I think we as a society are full of complexes, and it's these complexes that obstruct our view of ourselves, the positive things about ourselves. However, in my case, these complexes were the driving force for me to try to do something to make others like me. From a perspective, later on, I found out that complexes can be used for your own benefit. I have had various professions, and in at least three of them I have reached an international level. Now, years after the choreographies I created, or years after the shows where models were presenting my I surprised myself with what I did and that the things I did in the past are tested against time. No, you have reached, both of you, a moment where you are timeless, you are iconic, you are recognizable, and you are characteristic. The individual aesthetics of yourselves is seen through your work. Yes, I do have this impression, but I think it, it is derived from the fact that we are true in what we do. That's where the timelessness comes from. I don't care about current trends. Whether what I do fits within the trends or whether the trends, if what we do fits within a trend or a trend catch us up with what we do, then it's good. But it's the individuality and the truthfulness that we do through our work that make it timeless. I started making clothes because I liked nothing that was there in shops. I refitted everything I bought. Even if I bought something from a foreign, a Western designer, I had to narrow this piece of clothing, cut it short or something. That was ridiculous. So I decided to sew something or tailor something that was right for me. When I was in London or in New York, I spent time in shops. But now I decided to design my own things to wear, things that I like. And that's honesty. I wear what I produce, what I design. So I'm not selling junk to others. I can already see the organizers looking at me, suggesting that we are behind the schedule. So let's get to the point. What characteristics, in your opinion, are useful when you, went, when you want to make a success? Which things you should not give up? Which things you should focus? on in order to be professionally and privately successful. Well, if you have a vision, if you have a dream of yourself, of what you want to do, just be consistent. So draw up a plan and do it. Well, sometimes not even with a plan. I sometimes am quite chaotic, but organically I sense what I should do, in what direction I should go, what I should do one by one, or perhaps not even one by one. But consistency, I think that's the key word, plus determination, assuming that you do have a talent or an idea. However, remember that your talent is not everything, because on my way I have met a lot of talented designers who perhaps have not been strong enough mentally or maybe they have not had the right discipline. Well, discipline is not a word that I take lightly, but I think that consistency or discipline or the sense of obligation 
That's what we need. Some obligation towards the talent that we have been given. You have to work on your talent. You have to develop it. You cannot let it go to waste. My idea is that we should trust ourselves absolutely. We should listen to ourselves, not to all the smart asses that write about us or talk about us. From the perspective of time, now, when I go to a fashion show in Warsaw, there are none of those persons who used to try to hurt others present there. They are not there, but we are there. So that is important. When you see competitors, do not try to waste your energy to hate them. No, use other people to inspire yourselves, because that's when you can gain. If you hate others, if you criticize others, you lose yourselves, and you admit to being weak, to having weaknesses in yourself. If you trust yourself, if you believe in yourself, and if you are sure that that is the way you should be going, then even if you trip, even if you make mistakes, they will make you all the more characteristic. However, a critical outlook is important too, because criticism and hate, these are two different things. You should have a critical view of things around you. Well, I don't think it is worthwhile. That's a waste of energy. Well, that's depending on the definition of criticism you have in your head. I'm not talking about hating others, because that's a waste of energy that we shouldn't do. For example, I think that when we can help somebody else, then we should first help ourselves. We should use the energy that we have to improve ourselves and not others. We don't have an impact on somebody else's life, but you do have an impact on your own life. So the more energy you use for your own benefit, the sooner you get to your objective. One more thing. The persons who are around us, the persons who inspire us, those who help us, how important have they been in your lives, in what you do? Whatever we do, apart from the talent we have, the willingness we have, and all the characteristics, still the making of a product, the making of a service, and the idea of it is just a prelude. What comes later is systematic work the skill in communicating with others, the skill in promoting what you do, sending signals to the world, building image campaigns. Now, for example, you, Robert, are focusing more on video material, in developing online stores, other things, adapting to changing conditions, adapting to new tools. A lot of new tools have appeared in the market in recent times. Not a single person can encompass all of that, unless you are Gosha. Well, I was not able to work this out in the past. I did attempt at that. But actually speaking, I'm a person who does everything. However, this is not good. I would prefer to be like Robert. Robert has a great business partner, female partner, and that's just brilliant that you met Anna at that moment in your career where you were at the beginning. You helped each other and you made a fantastic thing out of it. So your business is developed in a brilliant way. It is very professional. That's just full professionalism. And that's what I would like to congratulate you on, but I also envy you a bit, the human way, because what you do is so nice.
You were really lucky. I and Anna Borowska share the company 50-50, meaning I do the design work and she does the rest. We have been doing this right from the beginning. Obviously, one of us knows what the other one is doing. That's very important. If you have a trusted person who will take care of something you have no idea about, because these could be issues of business, contracts, things that I hate personally. So here, it is important that you have another person to do that. When I focus on the design work, she designs the business. So Anna Borowska is involved in designing our company, in designing its development. And that is very important. Remember to have around you people who will believe in you, motivate you, and give you some positive energy. That matters a lot. You should not have around you people who will stop you intimidate you, destroy you. Even persons who are close to you can do such bad things unconsciously. So you have to carry out this cleansing around you and look closely at the people around you, your friends even, to see if they are the right persons. Thank you for that. We have two if pieces of information, a good one and a bad one. The bad one is that we have to finish, but the good one is that after the conference, if you have a willingness to ask any other questions and more questions, all of our speakers here will be present in the networking session behind the curtains. Robert Kupisza and Gosia Baczyńska. <laughs> Thank you. They are absolutely nice people. It's a great privilege to know them and to have this sense that the feeling that we started actually together. There are two exceptional meetings ahead of us. Cosmos Project are the first of them. These are two fantastic persons. I hope that Angelica will join me here on the stage. Come on, you had a pause, and now you can join me. I was waiting for you to miss me. Oh, yes, I have missed you. So you needed this blood from West Pomerania, right? That's a good thing, because on the stage we will have guests who represent that blood in 50%. They also represent the skill of taking care of their own business. They can design various objects, various things, and present fantastic specimens. I think we can bring them in, but there's also a laudation that we should deliver now. This is evidence that uh, as a duo you can do a lot of nice things. Cosmo Project was started by Ewa Bohen and Maciej Jelski. An important aspect of the design work is the conceptual approach to an object as an expressor of emotions, a conveyor of content. They started at Warsaw. School of Arts, but also Politecnico de Milano. After they graduated, they gained experience in um, Milano studios, cooperating with Denis Santacciaro, for example. I think they themselves will tell you more about themselves. But the list we have here are very long. They have shown their products in New York, Berlin, Milano, London, Łódź in Poland, and various others presentations of design work. In Stockholm, for example, Zachenta, the National Gallery of Arts. These are some of the places that they have dealt with. Sounds well. I think it's highest time we met them. Now let us ask the audience for applause. Cosmos Project, ahead of you now. Eva Bochen and Maciej. Eva Bochen 
and Maciej Jelski. Thank you for your applause. Good evening. It is a pleasure for us to be here. We are going to talk about emotions in designing. I have to admit that there's a lot of emotion here. We had great predecessors here on the stage, so the stress is huge. Let us then begin. Let us go back in time to 2011 when we created our first collection. The collection was inspired by old-time Slavic rituals. This collection was shown in Milano, Stockholm, Prague. So we have had a huge, wide range of audience. That collection included these masks that you can see in the photos. These animal masks are associated with an interesting anecdote. As, after some time, an unknown person contacted us, saying that that person had a dream over the night about such masks and said that that person wanted those masks for themselves to hang on the walls. That happened a few times, and this showed how strong the connection between the object and the audience can be. From the beginning of Cosmos Project, we started to design objects that could create a strong emotional tie with the recipient. That was our main objective. You might think that it's impossible to design something like that at the stage of initial designing, that it's easy to design the form, the color, but emotions are elusive and you cannot predict them. However, Researchers more and more often have been proving something that we felt intuitively right from the beginning of our careers. That Norman writes, for example, that very often the emotional value of the project is able to more strongly impact its success than its functionality. Martin Lindstrom, similarly, who speaks a lot about ritual aspects or our prejudices that impact strongly how we make our consumer decisions. He once said a story that I remembered a lot, it was very strongly. That was one research carried out, perhaps in one conference like this one, where there were researchers sitting in the audience and the speaker showed to them a navy blue sweater. And he asked, who would agree to try it on for $10? Almost everybody raised their hand. And then he added that it had been worn previously by a serial killer. Then most people gave up. So this suggests that the sweater, which was just a simple sweater, suddenly assumed a new negative value or strength. Then the speaker admitted that this was a hoax. However, this whole experiment shows how strongly our perception is irrational, how strongly our perception dis determines our approach to objects. In mid 2000s, as it was mentioned here before, we worked in Milano. I worked for Alessandro Medellino and Eva worked for Denis Santaniaro. We had the pleasure of learning from some of the best Italian designers, and we often heard from them that in 1980s, 
jeden z lepszych okresów włoskiego designu, kiedy to, uh, the Italian to design sector had a very good period where there was a lot of trust for them. A lot of experiments were carried out between the producers and the designers. In those times, a lot of interesting projects were conceived which are still being sold. We can definitely say that those were some of the best were years for Italian design. Our mentors used to say that it's producers' courage who are not afraid to trust the designer that was the driving force for their development. It allowed the designers to spread their wings and create such interesting projects. For sure, in the audience we have owners of companies who make decisions about large projects and for certain that you have experienced some worry before accepting someone new in the company coming in and introducing changes. I think that's the feeling that a designer brings with him or herself when entering a company. You never know how they will agree, the producer and the designer will agree with each other, whether they will use understandable languages, whether they will be communicative towards each other, whether the project that will be developed will satisfy the orderers expectations and whether the costs will pay off. Let us now talk about one of the most recent cooperations that we've had with Square Dog Company. Square Drop is a company which used to restore antiquities. They're great at it, but the owner of it, Agnieszka, decided to create its own brand, high-end brand of furniture made on order, a furniture of huge quality. The project we did differed hugely to what we used to do in the past. First of all, because after the initial phase when we approached the company with our initial designs, we thought that the collection would be colorful. Then when we started discussing it, we exchanged our experiences. We did some testing and research of what we like. Uh, we had to combine the vision of the owner and our with our vision, who is the address, who will be the target, will it be males or females. And we designed this collection called Oddity, a collection that is supposed to uh, exert influence uh, with all senses, not only uh, the sense of sight, but also touch. There is a lot of artifacts. There, There is brass, there is stone. Uh, there are multiple types of wood finish. And the selection of premium materials emphasizes and highlights all these features. And uh, I think that we were successful as proven by uh, the reaction um, of an architect from the UK. When the cabinet arrived, she was delighted and she said he wanted more. So for a designer, such feedback is always very inspiring and very satisfying. So when the intentions are really conveyed to the recipient or the user, this is what we are working on all the time. Over there we had, uh, we are facing a small family-owned company and the question is whether 
we can establish such a good cooperation with a large company, such a relationship where mechanisms of functioning are completely different, are more corporate. And here we have been invited to design a space of the home of idea. Uh, we were invited by Design Alive uh, to design um, a, an exhibition or a stand for a trade fair. So we had to, we were uh, Design Alive's partners with this project, and you had to combine eight different partners. So we had to do it on an in equal way so that the space was coherent, innovative, and allow for a possi possibility, give an opportunity of nice experience to the visitors. That's what it looked like. There was a lot of components. There was lighting, wall panels, fabrics, flooring. We were inspired by 1980s video games and the unusual worlds that are built and designed in computer games. And we wanted to give uh, the users, the visitors, such an experience. So we divided it into two parts. The first part was uh, more um, space for uh, discussions, business meetings with more light. And the second part is a less formal, uh, less formal space, a bit darker, um, a relaxed zone with more geometric forms. So it was also designed for uh, as a selfie opportunity. And the evidence of success of this cooperation is the fact that after establishing this idea house, we continued cooperation with two of those companies. One was Marbet, where we designed uh, a collection of bar stools, tables, and chairs. These are really interesting because although they look as interior furniture, they can be used outdoors, they can be used in at outdoor terraces and bars or restaurants. The name Phobos uh, comes from one of the uh, satellites of Mars. So these shapes were a big inspiration for us. Kolejna firma z którą bardzo dobrze nam się współpracowało, była... Yet another company that we cooperated with and we also met them at the Idea House is a company called Bujnie and we designed a, a series of modular uh, um, flower installations. We can do it in a modular way to design an entire green wall. So this was our objective to to establish, to, to introduce a large number of plants, not necessarily putting them on the floor. And this project uh, gained huge commercial success and we keep receiving information from the uh, company owner that they have to fight unfair competitors who copy this design. And it's a nice thing. We found out that uh, the Le Figaro's office in uh, Paris uh, is also now home to one of those flower installations. Here we have a design for an even larger brand. We have been cooperating with MPIC for many years. We uh, worked for them for literature festivals. During the pandemic, it turned out that the 
mm, company had to change their strategy because all the meetings with authors had to be moved online and we were invited to design a video recording studio. We, we thought about it because we did not want it to appear like a typical TV studio. We wanted to be an intimate space with full, uh, full of greenery and flowers so that guests can feel natural there. And this is what we came up with. Another design that we created together with one of the largest carpet manufacturers in Poland, Agnella, was the Future Illusions project. It was exhibited in New York, and it is slightly extraordinary in the sense that we spoke about emotions of our clients, customers, uh, entrepreneurs. Here we can talk about our own emotions. We lost control in a purposeful manner. We lost control over this project. If you have designers, we have design. If we have designers in this room, the most scary thing for a designer is to lose control. The designer wants to have full control from the very beginning till the end. They want to know what the final design will look like. Here, part of this of this design strength was given away to artificial intelligence and we did it uh, we were fully aware of that and we did it on purpose this carpet design is connected to an app and using the app now you can see pictures of some of those carpets those carpets were also inspired with 1980s video games. We have three fantastic worlds here, and within these worlds, artificial intelligence mm, assigns symbols, maps, and it creates an individual carpet pattern with individual number. But for such a unique carpet to be generated, you need to fill in a short psychological test form. If you want to experience that and design your own carpet, you can scan the code and you can see how it works. And the, the pattern or the model, the design will be sent to your email address. Maciek said that these carpets were demonstrated in New York. We did not take that into account. We thought that it would be a very rational, reasonable collection. And we were inspired with machines and the fact that they have an increasing influence on our lives. And it turned out that um, addressees, recipients who came from very different cultures, they had a different perception of that. They treated it as a sort of horoscope. And they were very emotional about the symbols that would be developed or uh, randomly assigned by the algorithm. They even asked us to interpret these designs. We were kind of surprised with that, but it was very pleasant. And now, one last design that we want to show you very closely connected to Szczecin. We are very connected to Szczecin as well. For the last two years, we, we are from Warsaw. Maciek comes from Szczecin, but we work in Warsaw. We were invited by the Dean of the Design Department of the Art Academy in Szczecin by Ms. Aurelia Manjuk, um, and we teach, we give lectures in uh, utility design, and we design decorations for the presentation of students' diploma thesis. It happened, in, it took place in 2021, and we wanted 
to show it to you. It took place at the Szczecin Philharmonic. We wanted to um, deviate from a typical presentation, typical exhibition. We wanted something that would uh, uh, stimulate stronger emotions. We have various utility design, typography, clothing, footwear, but we also have product designs and jewelry. And I hope we succeeded. And in this project, we combine decorations with choreography, music, we had live music, and please see for yourselves if we succeeded. Time. Marta Maso. Pragniesz zyskać dodatkowy czas na poświęcenie. You want to gain additional time to experience life. The subjective feeling of time is pushed aside. The time manager app will restore perception of time as individual impression, individual experience by manipulating real time. Iga Nikolishin, footwear design with piercing jewelry inspired with tattoos, piercing and scarification. It touches upon positive attitude towards oneself and others. The purpose is to deconjure negative perception of body modifications by giving them an interesting positive image. So it was a large project. And it succeeded thanks to cooperation with people uh, from the Arts Academy, the management board, and the uh, management of the Philharmonic Hall, where the entire show took place. The most important thing is cooperation and trust. And if you uh, have doubts about hiring a designer, sometimes this trust, when you go to a doctor, you are not always certain that they will heal you, that they will treat you, but you need to trust them. So here you need also need to trust the designer, and if cooperation goes well, if it's nice and friendly, even though the design might not be what you expected at the very beginning, it will certainly be something interesting. So I would like to encourage you to not be afraid. Thank you very much. Cosmos Project, Szanowni Państwo, możemy te brawa... Cosmos Project, and we could keep the applause going. For those of you who are wondering where Olivier is, we take care not only of business people, we take care of the show hosts. So he went to have a cup of coffee. And now uh, I will invite the guest uh, who will make our event more international, our special guest. And his work is also recognized and admired all over the world. His works were presented in Venice, at the Barcelona Science Museum, Maxi in Rome, and MoMA in New York. Let me start with figures. He's one of the 25 people who will change the world of design. And Fast Company uh, recognized him as one of the 50 most influential designers in the US. A professor, a lecturer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, where he heads a research group called Sensible City Lab. And he established an international design and innovation studio called Carlo Ratti Associati, um, based in Torino, Italy. So, 
Mr. Carlo Ratti, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great to see you. Dear Carlo, I heard that you have visited Szczecin one time. Yeah, I've, um, I've been here, I think, at this time it was like nine years ago, more or less. And uh, after these nine years, how do you see our city? Well, you know, I saw it change a lot. Believe, believe it or not, nine years ago, I think the Philharmonie was still being built. I remember I was looking, I was very curious, but I was looking just at the outside, uh, the site. So it's great to see all of this uh, changing and uh, evolving so fast. So it is also great to see that you have come back here and now the stage and our wonderful audience is all yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <coughs> well, and, uh, and uh, good evening, everybody. Great to be with, uh, with all of you tonight. So I was told tonight to talk about the city of tomorrow. And the first thing I want to tell you is that tomorrow is impossible to, to predict. Um, I want to show you how people saw tomorrow in the past. What you see here is a few illustrations from a number of French artists. They were, they were doing this uh, at the turn of the past century, like 1899, 1910. Um, and they tried to imagine life in the year 2000. And they got something right, like, you know, they saw mechanization in agriculture coming. They also saw Roomba, the leader of robot, clean our homes. That's how they imagined it. But they also got some things terribly wrong. According to them, I would have come to set in today uh, using one of these uh, whale buses, or the police would be patrolling our cities like this. The point I want to make is that um, this was made in a very beautiful way by the great uh, Karl Popper in a book called The Myth of the Framework. And he says, you know, the future is open, it's not predetermined, and thus cannot be predicted, except by accident. The possibilities that lie in the future are infinite. And those, I would say, are really the possibilities of design. You know, design is what can help us to turn the present into something different, into a future. But it's not about predicting the future, it's about using design to transform, for instance, a city. As we were just saying a moment ago about Stettin or any other city, using design in order to change the places we, we live. Well, we are passionate about cities. Um, it just, uh, if you need to remember, only four numbers about cities. Remember, 255, 75, and 80. Cities are only 2% of the surface of the planet. They're 55% of the population now. They're 75% of energy consumption, 80% of CO2 emissions. So if we can do something to make our cities a little bit more sustainable, well, that can be a big deal globally. And uh, what can we do today? Well, we can leverage an interesting thing. It's about networks. It's about digital. It's about how digital and physical are coming together in new ways. One way to look at this is to say that the internet is becoming internet of things, and it's changing. Again, the way we can understand, design, and ultimately live in, uh, in cities. So that's what we're passionate about. We do it both in research at MIT, we do it with our design office in New York, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, we do it also with some of the startups that came out of, um, of our ecosystem. But really, what all of that does it tried to work on the boundary between the artificial world and the natural world. And if you want to know, we know what the natural world is. The artificial world is, uh, is cities, is buildings, is objects, you know, is all these other things. And you could say that some of the big challenges we got today um, are really related, you know, first and foremost, climate change, are really related to thinking about artificial and natural, and two opposite. I think what we need to do as architects, but more general in society, is look at how we can bridge, we can look at those two as, as part of a co-evolution, artificial and natural. And so let me give you a few examples. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is how we can go from the artificial to the natural, thanks to data, thanks to intelligence, thanks to you know, uh, networks and sensors, we can look at the artificial world, like a city. What you're seeing here is actually the city of Lisbon, mapped using billions of data points collected from the, the mobility network. If you look at this, it looks like a living organism. We couldn't see a city like this just a few years ago. But we can today. And again, the city becomes almost alive because of networks. Networks lend a new life to the world of the, the artificial. 
You can do that also at the scale of a building. This is actually an existing building we, we, we recently worked on. It's uh, the Agnelli Foundation in uh, the city of Turin in Italy. Uh, the building is a building from the 50s and 60s, from the 50s. <clears throat> but actually, what we try to do here by looking at uh, sensors, networks, and, and data was turn the building into something that responds dynamically to people inside. So heating, lighting, cooling, all the different dimensions of the building are adjusted based on individual input. So the building becomes, again, like a living thing. And you, know, you see here, some of this was the first review, I thought it was funny, about, you know, finally, you know, we will not have thermostat wars anymore. But the key thing is, again, is that thanks to sensors, networks, and intelligence, the building, any building, any city can start responding to the living thing. You see here some images. The before you saw the 1950s part, this is the older part from the early 20th century. But both of them actually uh, start behaving in different ways thanks to data. But the other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, went too fast, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to mention was not only from the artificial to the natural, but today also focusing on the natural to the artificial. So how nature itself can be more part, can be become the building block of what we do in our cities and in our buildings. You know, people have been trying to do this for a long time. If you look at this, it's a beautiful image by Frank Lloyd Wright, the great American architect, operating around 100 years ago. And uh, this is Broadacre City. And in that case, you know, at the time, people were trying to move the city into the countryside, the city into nature, the artificial world into the natural world, in order to create a better alliance. But we all know what happened. So this was the dream, these were the images, the beautiful images from the time, but then they turned out to be this. You're basically destroying all of the natural places, destroying all the city, destroying and eating up all of the surroundings with infinite suburbia. And uh, so I would say that today the goal and the objective is the opposite. This is a picture from the city, our city of Milan, you know, is uh, really not how to expand the city outwards, but especially in this century, in Europe and the United States, cities are not growing anymore. Yes, cities are growing in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in other parts of the world, but here they're not. And then the challenge, I would say, is the opposite. Not, not to expand the city anymore, but try to see how we can bring more of the natural world back into the city, closer to us, to our buildings, and to the places we, we live and we love. Um, and uh, we've been working on this for a number of years. The same thing, what I was saying before, natural and artificial, you know, look at it from the left to the right or the other way around. In this case, you know, bringing nature. This is again in the core of Milan. It's um, for the Trussardi Fashion House. This was uh, around 10 years ago, was just refurbished re recently, was the first project in Italy with uh, Patrick Blank, uh, who developed the idea of vertical uh, garden. Um, and again, we wanted to bring in the core of Milan next to the Scala Theater. Scala Theater is uh, 10 meters away. Uh, again, a small magic and, and hidden garden where people could meet, congregate, like a cover public space. Yes, it's a cafe, but really it's like a cover public space for, uh, for the city, as you see here. Uh, this one is another project in Milan. It's actually transforming the World Expo 2015 site. I don't know if any of you has, has been to the World Fair in 2015. Actually, the follow-up was in, in Dubai last year. Um, we also did the Italian pavilion there. But in 2015, we both worked on the Expo and on the transformation of this site after the Expo. And again, here, your nature is becoming the, the main axis for the development of uh, what they call Milan Innovation District, which is the whole uh, 2015 Expo site. This is a project that opened just a few weeks ago, and uh, <clears throat> it's one of the tallest skyscrapers in Singapore. And here what we had uh, was a building where at the top we had offices, in the lower part we had a service apartment, and the idea was why don't we create in the middle, again a public space, a square, for people to meet, to congregate, to keep on working. One of the things I suffer a lot in Singapore, I spent a lot of time in Singapore over the past uh, 10 years, um, it's actually usually you're locked into building. You're almost like into, you feel like into, into a fish tank. And so here the idea was can you be outdoor, you know, control climate, be with nature, and, uh, and create a place for people to meet on both sides. You see some of the images of the, the place in the middle, how we imagined it initially, the entrance to the building as well, and then uh, 
uh, here are actually some of the pictures. Uh, uh, this was just before it was finished. You find more pictures online since completion, but you see the trees are still growing and becoming the main presence into the building. Um, <clears throat> or in this project on a small scale, in this project, uh, this is a project for, in Italy, again, we go back to Italy, um, for a person called Muti. Uh, Muti is one of the leading producers of high-end uh, tomato products in the, in the world. And actually, that's very close to the, the factory where that is done, but he doesn't see the factory as a factory, but more as an extension of the countryside. So what we tried to do was to build a whole house where actually nature was in the core, and the whole architecture would be around it. When you look at this, this is a 50-year-old tree, which is uh, over 10 meters high, and the whole architecture moves around it. So as you are moving through the different spaces, it's like, you know, Adolf Loss, 100 years ago, was talking of round plan. Well, it's a similar idea, but not with empty space in the middle, but with nature at the core, uh, at the core of it. Or in this small project on the Himalayas, again, in this project trying to create feedback loops with the local population doing the minimum and allowing people to fill um, all of the different missing parts, uh, you know, windows or parts of the, <clears throat> or, or other things, so doing a skeleton um, and then allowing the infill to be customized locally, involving local labors and local ideas and local, local design. Um, this one, which is uh, uh, going back to Milan, it's a building next to the Prada Foundation, where if you look at that, there's a big ramp that goes up so that everybody inside the building has access to outdoor space, but more importantly, also access to, to green and to nature. The building is very close. You see the Prada Foundation down there. We are, we are now working with um, Liz Diller and Lee Polisano. As you might know, Liz Diller uh, did the High Line in New York on the bigger master plans next to it, but basically the key principle is the same nature to connect different parts uh, of the city. Well, and uh, <clears throat> uh, many of these themes then come together in different ways. In this case, you know, the Salone Milan Design Week was mentioned before in the, in, in the previous presentation. Um, in, uh, in this case, we had to design the opening act for Milan Design Week in 2018. Uh, and uh, we really wanted to think about design and make a statement about design. You know, we had a lot of conversations with the organizers, and we all agreed, yes, you know, furniture is important. Milan Design Week starts as a furniture fair. But today, the challenge is the planet are not going to be solved by designing another beautiful chair. You know, there's 70 billion chairs on the planet. You know, not, we're not going to, to need many more of them. But I think the role design can be crucial if we look at it as a way to, to deal with, uh, again, the natural and the artificial, nature, climate change, and how to combine uh, all of that. So we try to do this. This is in Milan. To the left, you see the Duomo, the cathedral. To the right is the, the, the royal palace. This was the opening of the of Milan Design Week, and what we try to do is imagine a garden where in a sustainable way you get energy from the sun and use the energy from the sun to change the microclimate underneath. And underneath, again, in the core of the city, you bring nature, but you bring nature where by changing climate you can have four seasons at the same time. So a garden where by moving through space, you are moving through, through time. You're moving from the spring to the fall, uh, to the summer, to the winter, you know, just by moving for a few, a few meters. Um, you see it here, this was actually the built uh, uh, building. You see it here with uh, the different parts. Um, you know, you had the, win the winter side, was actually very, very cold, real snow inside, you know, just a bit of water and real snow inside. Um, <clears throat> the spring, we blossom in trees. Um, the, the summer, summer was really, really sticky. Also, you know, if you do it right, you get the energy from the sun, you use it in order to change the climate, but a little bit like your refrigerator, when you're producing cool on one side, you got heating on the other side. So by doing that, you manage to, to, to use, again, a circular approach also to heating and, uh, and cooling. So this was a very sticky summer. Uh, you know, we had everything for the Milanese summer, apart from the mosquitoes. Um, So again, you know, going back to the natural and artificial, I think the key challenge, as I was saying, 
for us as designers, architects, planners, but really for society at large, is how can we reconcile the two poles? And you know, we saw a few examples that was very quick, going from the left to the right, right to the left, from the natural to the artificial, or vice versa. But the truth is, in most cases, you play with both dimensions at the same time. In most cases, it's really looking at a future which is more about co-evolution between the natural and the artificial world. And, and here I want to share with you a project we're working on in Helsinki that has both dimensions. The project started as a result of what was called the Helsinki Energy Challenge a couple of years ago. Now, um, Helsinki, uh, the capital of Finland, uh, as you uh, might imagine, a lot of the, the needs, the energy needs of the city are related to heating. And there's good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is actually the city has what is called a district heating system. Usually district heating is great. This is creating something that means that you produce power, and as you produce power, you got as a byproduct a lot of hot water. You run the hot water through the city, and so you, that helps it to heat the city. So that's usually good, but bad news. And the bad news is actually that most of the power generation in Helsinki is still related to coal. And the city decided to decommission the coal power plants initially by 2030, now it looks like even earlier than 2030. So the mayor was looking for new solutions, and this did something that, for cities, is usually very brave. You know, cities, um, when they need to solve a problem, usually they follow what is called best practices. So you look at what other cities have done, and you copy them. But if you do that, you know, if you think about it, that's the opposite of innovation. If you follow best practices, you look at another city who maybe 10 or 20 years before had an idea, then you know, designed the thing, implemented it, built it, and then you know, saw that the thing worked. But uh, if you're doing that, if you copy that, you're just perpetuating that. You're locking the future into the past. So the mayor did something that was, uh, was quite brave for a city. And uh, I wrote an article about this. I'm not saying just here I, 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 about the fact that the procedure was very interesting. I wrote actually a couple of articles you find uh, online if, you, if you're interested, uh, which was much more similar to what the X Prize Foundation does in the United States. So the X Prize Foundation puts a prize, usually takes very complex challenges, and then it puts a prize in the middle, and allows people from all over the world to uh, compete. A few people are selected, and finally somebody, one or more teams, uh, win uh, uh, the prize. So the mayor decided to do the same thing. Exactly two years ago, it was phase one. Over 250 teams from all over the world participated, big teams, big companies, uh, large teams, and so on. Ten finalists, um, and then uh, in the end, uh, the winners were announced uh, a year and something ago. Uh, we were one of the winners together with um, uh, three others. And uh, first of all, when I say we, uh, it's both our design office, but also when we tackle, when we look at the city, we look at very complex problems, that it's very important to be transdisciplinary. So in this case, we had different engineers, Rumble or TransSolar, great German engineers, you know, probably number one in the world for climate engineering. Um, SVP, uh, Jörg Schleich's uh, former office, um, dealing with very lightweight structures. The first thing, if you want to be sustainable, is use the minimum amount of material. But also big companies like Danfoss or Schneider or OP, Squintober, who help us to engage the public. By the way, one important thing, we believe a project is always about a conversation. It's about engaging citizens, it's about you know, having feedback. And sometimes you get positive or negative feedback, it doesn't matter. That's what happens in nature. It goes back to what we were saying about the natural and the artificial. The fact that you know, basically, if you, in this co-evolution, you want to follow the same mechanism, what does nature, what does nature do? Well, you know, it's about trying something, getting feedback, and improving on that. So somehow, you know, Squint Opera helped us to, to engage a broader constituency in the project. Here's a little video, then I'll tell you more about, uh, in, more in detail about the project. We're excited to present to you the hot heart, an innovative solution to decarbonize health city. Here is how we do it.
All right, so um, very briefly, you saw the, the gist of it in the movie. But again, in this case, there's good news and bad news. So good news is what you see there to the left. We look at that to the left, you see the changes in, for instance, this is uh, wind power prices over time. So the changes in the price of renewable over time. And the good news is actually the price has been going down immensely. So all over the world today, if you're producing with wind or with sun, well, sometimes it's the cheapest source of energy. If you look at that, you know, the key, by the way, the key measure of energy is usually the megawatt hour. So it's one megawatt for one hour. And that will cost you around the world in order produced by, you know, by, by, with sun or wind, will cost you anything between 10 to 30 euros. So that's a great news. It's a great news for the planet. And you might say, then, why don't we all use renewables instead of relying on uh, Russian gas or oil from other countries and so on? Well, there's also bad news, which is what you see to the right. And as you know, sometimes you got uh, a lot of wind, sometimes you don't have enough wind. Sometimes you got a lot of sun, sometimes you don't. I actually was thinking about this, uh, you know, when I was coming here, I drove from Berlin, and you see all the, the windmills, and sometimes, you know, you got, especially, you know, when you need most energy, sometimes, you know, you, you lack enough power to, uh, enough power in the grid. Well, you might say, okay, uh, but, you know, what's the problem? That's what batteries are for. Yes, you're absolutely right, but if you think about batteries, remember, one megawatt hour will cost you 10 to 30 euros, let's say 20, depends on where you are on the planet, but the battery to store that megawatt hour will cost you 200,000. Simply, it's not feasible. It's too expensive to store $20 worth of power. We require 20 euros, same thing. We require you 200,000 euros of, uh, of battery. Uh, so in this case, in the case of Helsinki, we, we did something that uh, we tried to explore something that turned out to work quite, quite well, which is the following. Then in the end, you need to convert this into heat. And so why not to do something that normally is not what you want to do? If you are an engineer, you can call this a thermodynamic crime. Why a crime? Because you are turning, call it a higher form of energy, power, into heat. But A, in the case of Helsinki, ultimately you need to heat the city. So if you turn it into heat at the beginning, you store it into heat. So if you call it like a thermal battery, as you saw in the movie, in the video, then you know the cost is not 200,000 per megawatt hour, it's closer to 200 euros per megawatt hour. And then at that point, it makes sense. You can have, as you see there, both a floating reservoir or an embedded <laughs> reservoir. Um, this is, you know, is what, uh, what you saw before. To the left, you got all the power sources to produce. In the middle, you got the storage, a thermal battery, what we call the hot heart of Helsinki. And to the right, you plug it in into the city uh, of Helsinki. So then you reuse also all of the pipes which are already in the city. So you just plug it into the, the existing system. And what you see in the lower part is how this is compatible with different energy mixes. Again, since we did this, things have changed immensely, as you know, because of, uh, of the war and, uh, and other local conditions. So somehow important that this is compatible, as you see there, with many different uh, kind of mixes of energy as it could be in 2030 or 20, 2040. And as we were doing that, we also saw, well, by doing this, there's also additional benefits. So the first one, we help the whole grid, the grid of Finland, also the whole grid of Scandinavia and the Nordic countries, uh, because when you're equalizing the grid with something like the hot card, the whole, the, the whole system has a benefit. Remember the curve with a lot of spikes? You're basically lowering some of the spikes, flattening the curve, and it has an impact on the whole, uh, on the whole grid. But the, uh, the other thing we say, well, these beautiful places are floating public spaces, so why not to turn them? into a place for citizens. Again, so citizens are part of this. It's not a hidden piece of infrastructure, urban infrastructure. It becomes something that uh, can actually teach about uh, climate change, about decarbonization, about energy, and, uh, and all of this. So can we bring people there and create an experience at the, the top? Well, I'll, uh, I will not bore you with uh, all the studies to see where to put it in the Gulf of, uh, of Helsinki. Um, these are the details, you saw them before, with the different, the, the configuration of the hot car. Every reservoir is around 225 meter diameter in this configuration. Uh, and then on the top, you've got these other four biodomes, again, to attract people, so that people can go there and enjoy, you know, learn about uh, what we were saying about energy and so on, but also enjoy each other's company, and uh, they become like a new type of public space, maybe centered around nature, about wellness, about, uh, you know, the fact that energy is what supports our lives, and we can live it. We can live the, uh, that uh, on the top of the, the reservoirs. 
Um, so, uh, a small thing, as I said before, the first thing, if you want to be sustainable, design something that uses the minimum amount of matter. So clearly, if you use a lot of concrete, a lot of steel, that means a lot of energy to produce it, to put it into place, and so on. So the, the lighter you are, usually, the better it is for the environment. And in this case, um, that is where, as I said, Jörg Schleich's office uh, came into play. Um, <clears throat> the, one of the most efficient structures you can imagine is very similar to a bicycle wheel. A bicycle wheel is just uh, the rim with a lot of spokes that avoid the buckling. So uh, the idea, if you want, you know, the, the, the reservoirs, every reservoir, as imagine, is this kind of big uh, uh, rims, quite thick. They are done in the same way how you do pipelines. But then we got the spokes in order to, to stabilize. So uh, somehow, just in a nutshell, um, we think we can complete it by 2028, so two years ahead of the schedule the mayor gave. All of the energy for heating in Helsinki, remember again that measure, you know, the megawatt hour? Well, if you multiply by 1,000, you get a gigawatt hour. If you multiply by 6,000, that's what the whole city of Helsinki needs for heating in the course of the year. So, so that can actually store all of the heat needed for, for the year. Something that surprised us was actually an X point. Uh, at the beginning, we started working on this, and we said, well, OK, we are going to do, there's going to be the need of a big investment. And uh, you know, there's uh, renewables instead of coal and all of that. So in the end, we thought people in Helsinki might need to pay every megawatt hour more. So their bill, at the end of the month, may be maybe 10% more. Well, big surprise, it turns out actually, based on the calculations now, it can be 10% less than, uh, than what it is. And these numbers with uh, the changes in, in energy prices over the past six months seems to be even better in terms of reduction compared with, uh, with the baseline. With the two bonuses I mentioned, one is about load balance in the whole Finnish grid and also the four tropical forests, uh, or the four public spaces, is a new global attraction. And yes, you know, it's a, it's a big investment, but it pays itself back. And one of the things we'd like to do is to see, well, could this be done also with uh, some kind of fund where everybody, a citizen of Helsinki, from Finland, from Europe, can, uh, can contribute to it. So I wanted to finish with this, but if you need to retain something, is in this project you see the two components, you know, the natural and artificial coming together in so many different ways, about feedback loops, about nature itself, about intelligence, artificial intelligence, optimizing all the flows. And I think, you know, that's really what we need to try to do, looking at the future where we don't have a fracture or a fight between city and countryside, natural and artificial, but the two become parts of the same coevolution. Thank you. Carlo Ratti, proszę Państwa. Bardzo dziękuję. Please stay with us. I, stay with us. I, I, I didn't know if I had to go away or, or wait for you. So anyway, that's why. Stay with us. Stay with us. <laughs> uh, because we will do all together a lovely final for everyone. To jest dobra opcja, proszę Państwa, żeby wszystkich naszych prelegentów zaprosić. Bo proszę sobie wyobrazić, że też siedzieli tyle godzin co Państwo. Żeby być wielki szacunek dla Was. Nie było ruchu, łażenia w tej weftej tej i wszyscy Państwo wytrwaliście. A to jasny dowód na to, że to, co zostało tutaj przygotowane, spodobało się Państwu. My w Warszawie zazdrościmy Wam takiego wydarzenia. My w Wielkopolsce, skąd pochodzę też, my we Wrocławiu, gdzie studiowałem, też Wam za, bardzo zazdrościmy. Także... To my bardzo serdecznie na pomoże zapraszamy. Tak, tak, kochani, zapraszamy na wszystkich naszych gości, którzy są. Mam nadzieję, że i Gosia, i Robert Kupisz są z nami. Są, chodźcie, nie krępujcie się, jest i Kasia, e, państwo nasi z tej mody pięknej. I Oskar też został. Oscar is also with us. Please join us here. Please take a step forward into the spotlight. Please, one step forward, because we need to see your face in, in the light. So let's all come closer together. And you know what to do. West Pomerania. It was all about design, innovation, creativity, modernity. This was all for you, and I hope that you took all the best things possible 
I would like to thank the organizers for doing a great job and a big thank you to the attendees from the organizers. I think a very important thing uh, is that you'll be able to meet and talk to our guests in the networking zone. Yes, it's an important piece of information. Our guests will remain, will stay here with us, so uh, you didn't have the opportunity to ask them any questions, but you will have that opportunity in the final part of the evening. But I believe that the, uh, your self-confidence, openness to other human beings will be an overarching element for all of us. Thank you very much for your great job and for your um, presence here. You are great. So they will join you in the networking area. Thank you all very much for what we had the pleasure to experience with you together with Angelika. Uh, and we have some news about other people who will be waiting for you in the networking area. You will be able to meet Joanna Jurga, whom you probably know already. She had the opportunity to be here in Szczecin earlier to share her knowledge. Joanna Jorga will be accompanied by Katarzyna i James Briggs. And you will be able to listen to a presentation on challenges and trends in modern design. That's for those of you who, do not, who are not fed up with knowledge. Uh, Otherwise, bon appetit, I wish you a nice evening and then a safe way back home afterwards. Thank you.